Well, first I want to thank the organizers for asking me to be here and talk about the work that you know, my, myself and my group, really my group, has done. Um, and as I think it's already been alluded to, my interest is, is myopic in the sense that I am a clinician, I'm a cardiologist who maintains an active though somewhat limited practice. And my group is heavily involved in using machine learning for clinical decision making. So I think oftentimes having conversations with computer scientists who are sort of working at the forefront of this, of this area, there is um, not a full understanding of what really are the specific requirements that will make machine learning be adopted by the clinical community to the benefit of patients. And so I wanted to focus a little bit on that today based on some work that we've done and open up a sort of a broader colloquy that hopefully will we'll, uh, continue past this, uh, past this talk. So what does healthcare look like today in 2019? So we have the clinician, we have a patient, oh, this is short, very long, and the patient gives some information to the clinician. That information comes in a variety of forms. Here we have a patient that's been admitted to the hospital, hence they're on a, the gurney, and there are laboratory studies, there's physical exams that happen by a number of healthcare professionals as this patient traverses the healthcare system. And then the clinician has to process these data to decide what actions are in the best interest of the patient. So, you know, the questions that the clinician has in his or her mind is, is this somebody that really is going to have really an adverse event in the near future? How can I process the information to be able to make a decision that is in his or her interest? But the, the, uh, the relay of information is really not as simple as is depicted here. It's really more like this. You know what I mean? This is a patient who is in an intensive care unit. There are multiple sensors, multiple pieces of data, that, and, the, and the clinician is bombarded with with this information, and then in this instance, but the questions are the same. So the clinician asks, what is this patient's risk of adverse outcomes? Is this somebody you have to worry about? Is this somebody who have to expend resources to make better, to lower his or her risk? And moreover, then once I decide whether this is a patient that is at high risk or not, what's the optimal therapy? So these decisions are wrought with a lot of uncertainty for a variety of reasons. First, first there's limited resources. We can't do all tests on all patients. I'm not sure we'd want to in any case. In addition, we don't have optimal guidelines for the majority of the patients that we see. There's lots of clinical trials, lots of effort, money, and resources have been invested in finding optimal therapies by using randomized clinical control trials. But in practice, the patients that we see, the very sick patients, they wouldn't be enrolled in any of those trials. So then it becomes unclear how the observations that arise from those trials are useful for clinical decision making. And as is really depicted here, we have data overload. So where is it that um, these methods, AI, machine learning, can really make an impact in clinical decision making? Well, we have all of these complexities that are, arise from the care of patients, but data science can help us identify patients who are at increased risk, patients who, um, and, and intelligent clinical decision support, change in monitoring therapies. There's lots of promise that this, that this holds. So when we often talk about this, and we want to sort of simplify this into where these techniques can be the most fruitful, we have the physician being bombarded with lots of data, and we can replace the physician with something, right? Something that processes these data, finds trends, be able to learn important relationships that may be quite complex between the different variables that, the, that arises from the patient, and it provides simpler information to the patient so that he or she can make informed clinical deci decisions. Then, you know, you look at the literature, you um, look at even the clinical journals nowadays, and you'll see, find many papers that purport lots of advances in this area. So even most recently, there's been um, lots of advances, actually. I think this is really, this is how the most advances, I think, have been made in the area of looking at medical images and being able to sort of pick up very unique and subtle um, inferences from complex data, diagnosis of cancer and such. There was a recent paper that looked at arrhythmia classification using the types of images that myself and I think some of the others in the room, cardiologists use all the time, electrocardiographic data and also a cancer prognosis. But the interesting thing is, although the, you, know, you do a literature search, I think in the last five years, even just in, within PubMed, there's 10, 20,000 papers that purport to use these methods and make very significant findings. But if you go into the hospital and you talk to the boots on the ground, you really recognize that this is the case. 
Right? So wh while machine learning in the healthcare sphere, I think everyone recognizes that this is important. It's really not been embraced by the clinical community. And so the question is, why is that? Well, returning back to this paradigm, you have some very abstract animal that takes all of these signals arising from a patient and hopes to give these data to, to the clinician so that he or she can use it for clinical decision making. But if you looked inside of this box, it really can be things that are very quite complex, you know, models very complex relationships between input features and outputs that are of clinical interest. And, and you know, at the end of the day, Things like this, these deep artificial neural networks are typically complex, many modifiable parameters, and are notoriously difficult to understand by the layperson and to explain to the clinician. And why is that, why is that a hindrance? Well, the clinician, when he or she sees this black box, has very little intuition on how the model arrives at a particular, particular result. So, you know, uh, the expert may uh, train a particular model and say, well, I've tested it on a variety of different types of data, and it has these performance metrics, and so I think that this is something that you should adopt. But the clinician, you know, he or she would, would say, well, you know, the first medical school, I think, was established in 1765. So we have 200, more over 200 years worth of medical um, data science, right? And how does what you have created how does it agree? Does it agree with these hundreds of years of data that we have amassed, what I've learned in medical school, all of these prior observations? So even though the performance of the model is good, how can I be sure that it'll work on my specific patient? I know what happens with the cardiac output if you increase the heart rate. And I know what'll happen with the blood pressure, assuming certain resistance. I have these physiologic relationships in my mind that are quite durable, right? So they've been born over time in various animal models and patients. We see this all the time. That, that is something I believe. But this is kind of difficult to, you know, to reconcile this with my prior understanding. Moreover, and I think, you know, the related question, is this model consistent with what I know about human disease? Let's say I gave it features corresponding to a patient who I thought was very, very sick. Is this model going to tell me what I think should be the result? Right? And, and if you can't, you can't begin from that premise, then I think it's very hard to even begin the colloquy with a clinician and even, uh, even harder for uh, clinical acceptance to be the case. So I'm going to look at these two different animals and, you know, and call them in sort of different names. So this is explainability. I think it falls under the rubric of, of explainability, and this was discussed by the, I think somewhat by the, by the previous uh, speaker. And the former, I'm going to call trust, right? Can I trust that the model will work on different subgroups or different types of patients that I think are, are important? So when you talk about how machine learning models are typically evaluated in the, in the literature, at least in the literature that I'm familiar with, um, it's just, you know, statistical measures of performance. There's the accuracy, the discriminatory ability, all of these metrics that we are familiar with. But the point here is that in the healthcare sphere, accuracy does not, nor should it, mean that the resulting model gain clinical acceptance. So getting back to this model of trust and explainability, I just want to talk a little bit. I think these are the two paradigms that um, I think one has to um, resolve their model with in order to have a conversation with a clinician before we can, before we can achieve, a, before the model can really be embraced by the clinical community. So first, let's talk a little bit about trust. So trusting individual predictions. So what do I mean by that? Let's go to the engineering literature. We talk about understanding failure modes. And, and why is this important? So unlike other non-clinical domains, incorrect predictions can really have disastrous consequences right, for a particular patient. You know, and when I speak to, I, if, uh, when I speak to um, attorneys of mine who are friends, their first thing is, oh yeah, well somebody's gonna sue you, right? You know, that's not the main thing, because to the family that's involved, it's the health and welfare of their, of their loved one. Um, so for example, a patient that's high risk, when they're really low risk, you may obligate them to have lots of invasive therapies or lots of dangerous maneuvers that itself entail some risk. Um, if you predict the patient to be low risk, when they actually are high risk and the intervention itself is not very high risk, then you've missed an opportunity to do some good, potentially save a life, which is the questions we often deal with in the cardiovascular arena. So what we would like to know is for any model, what are the characteristics of the data associated with incorrect predictions and when can we really trust the output of the model? Given a specific patient, how do we know that that model is really applicable to that 
to that patient. Now, this is not new. People have talked about this sort of stuff before. I think mainly sort of in other in other settings. You know, we have these statistical measures of performance. We can get you know sensitivity, specificity, precision. You know, some kind of aggregate statistics about trustworthiness. But in, it's still difficult to know whether that is really applicable and how to use that for a single prediction or for a particular patient subgroup. So what is often done, or what can be done, is if you train a model on a particular training set, so you know the data that the model has looked at to learn whatever it has learned, and then a new patient comes along, well, you can compare that new patient to the training data, and if that patient is very different from the training data, you can say, well, you know, I don't know if the performance of the model is going to be great in that, in that, in that respect. So all viable, all viable things to do. The problem is that, you know, clinical data sets are hard to come by. You know, we have sort of individuals who we spend a lot of time gathering clean, derangled um, data sets from which, from which uh, um, models for specific tasks are trained. And getting access to those training data to really know whether a new patient that you have is really different is kind, of, is kind of challenging. You'd have to ask the person who has access to those data to be able to do such, um, such analyses. So whether, the, you know, it's a separate conversation, this is a conversation about not what things should be, but this the currently how things are with respect to data. Um, and to address these sorts of issues. So we um, took a look at this um, some time ago. A very talented student in my group, Paul Myers, did some work in terms of, well, how can we get an estimate of reliability for a given, for a given patient? And we don't, really, we don't really have access to the, to the training data. So you have, let's say you have a model. It's been trained on a particular data set. You have a model prediction for a given patient. So let's say we could use another method for the same outcome, and we could generate a new prediction using a different method. And let's say we use, and to do this, we use a generative model. So what does that mean? We don't have access to the actual data set, but we have simulated data. So if we had some general statistics about not the precise training data itself, but some general statistics on the training data, we can sort of make some quick calculations about what the prediction would be if we generated some data and used another model to be able to make the prediction. When the two predictions disagree, we say the training data are insufficient to give a robust prediction for patient, for the patient X. Very simple. And um, so the process leads to an unreliability score, and which we could calculate for each patient, and we can then identify patient subgroups for which the model is, we expect the model to be not, not, uh, not very good just because the training data really don't need to lead to a robust assessment for that patient. So you can actually analytically derive what this score would look like. And this, you know, this is just to show you that it can be done. We make some assumptions about the prior distributions of positive and negative patients. This is for a binary classification problem. And we have a score which goes between 0 and 1. The higher the score, the more unreliable the prediction is. So you give this to a clinician, and what kind of questions are they, are they going to ask? Well, you know, reliability is an interesting concept, but how do I use this in, in, in practice? Well, I, I, the statements I think that are most, the most dispositive are, well, if a patient has a high um, um, unreliability score, your prediction is likely to be wrong. The discriminatory ability for patients who have that score is likely to be reduced. And so those are the questions that we asked. And we did this sort of on uh, ask those questions for patients that had high unreliability scores. And using old established data sets, we have access to what's called it's an old registry used to develop a clinically established score for estimating the risk of patients who have an acute coronary syndrome. The acute coronary syndrome, one simple way to think about it, it's like a heart attack. And so patients who had this, you know, this, uh, this phenomenon get uh, enrolled in this registry and you follow them over time, over 70,000 patients. So we, we had a subset of this, about 70,000 patients, where we tested this on. We use an established risk score that clinicians use all the time. And the question is, if you use this risk score on, some, on these patients and you look at those patients that have high unreliability score, what does the model do on that patient subset? And so here, this is a look at accuracy. We have an accuracy measure, which is called the Breyer score, which is the sort of the mean average error of the prediction. So we know the truth in this case, a supervised machine learning problem, and the red are those patients that have very high unreliability score, and the black are patients that do not. So the, the utmost left are the patients that have the highest unreliability score, and it's much less, much less accurate, because the error is much lower, and those that are not in the lowest 99th percentile of unreliability scores. As you go higher, so the top 5%, 10%, 25%, 50%, the model gets better, but it's still significantly worse 
than the portion of the data that have low unreliability scores. Similarly, if we look at the discriminatory, discriminatory ability and we look at the AUC, when the unreliability score is high, then we have much reduced uh, discriminatory ability with uh, AUC going down to about 0 0.5, it's sort of a random guess. So the, the upshot is high unreliability using this very, so, very sort of simple metric. You really just had to sort of write down some math to get some equations that gave us a robust result and make some assumptions about the underlying distribution. The assumptions are quite simple. We assume an underlying normal distribution for both positive and negative cases. So in addition, unreliable predictions are the most inaccurate. So if you look at calibration curves for those patients who have low unreliability scores, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's not perfect, y equal x is perfect, but it certainly is much well better calibrated than those patients that have high unreliability scores. The red is a high unreliability score. The blue is a low unreliability score. And although we don't have the exact training set with us, if we took a look at all of those patients that have very high unreliability score, they form a distinct distribution from those patients that have different un, um, low unreliability scores. So what's plotted here is the difference. How different is a patient who has a high unreliability score from everything else in the data set? And those patients are most different. High unreliability score correspond to patients who differ the most from the training set. So I think one of the points that I wanted to get across here, just in this simple, um, and you know, there's nothing really fancy here. We just sort of made some simple assumptions about the underlying data. We developed a score, I think, that we is on a, uh, a reasonable scale. And it, we formed a score that I think one could have a discussion with a clinician that talks about outcomes that he or she thinks are important, the discriminatory ability and the accuracy. So reliability metrics that identify potential failure modes, I think, form an important part of any clinically useful score. And a clinically useful unreliability score should really identify patient subgroups where the model performance is worse, is compromised. So it's really not applicable to that particular set as one would assume by looking at its performance over the entire data set as a whole. So just one example of trust, a concept that I think is important and really paramount in the use of, of machine learning models in the healthcare sphere. But explainability, I think, is another one. So you save the hard stuff for last, right? Because this is when people start to doze off coffee starts to wear off so you don't pay so much attention, so don't realize that it's really much of a hard problem if you don't have that much to say about it. Now, there's lot, lots of people have thought about explainability, including the speaker that was here previously, and there's an, um, a previous paper several years ago by Zach Lipton, I think it's often quoted, from the Communications of the Association of Computing Machinery, ACM, and talking about explainability, really what does it mean? Because I hear many people talk about explainability in the healthcare sphere or not, but it's really hard to know what that is and if one can devise an objective um, definition of it. But at its very, very base, if you think about it, at a very high level, when you say that a model is explainable, you can really say how the model works and you may be able to learn from the model. So you can ask, what do you have to tell me that I didn't know already? So there's some concepts that Zach talks about, I think that are really very, very insightful, transpar transparency. So for a model to be fully understood, a human should be able to take the input data together with the parameters and in reasonable time steps uh, through every calculation required to produce a prediction. One should be able to do that. So for a deep learning model, it's a challenging task. Decomposability, that each part of the model, each input parameter calculation admits an intuitive explanation. So I think these things make, you know, at a very high level, but how to convey this in a, in a, in a discussion is challenging. There are some post hoc methods that have looked at um, reliability. So, you know, some natural language processing has talked about text explanations from some very complicated model visualization. Saliency maps, in particular, used with CNNs and image to help you identify where in the data is really the, mo what parts of the data are the most dispositive for making any given prediction. So all of these concepts, I think, have been sort of talked about in the literature, and this is only a, a small snapshot of them. And I think that's all well, well and good. But now, trying to apply these notions in the healthcare sphere is a little different. So now, their methods do exist to understand what a deep learning model, I'm gonna focus on deep learning, that's sort of where all, most of the literature in the clinical sphere is. And we know we have sort of deep learning to the very, very simple, very simple um, um, way. We have some input features. We have a latent space. We have some abstract data representation that eventually goes to something, some output that we care about. So when the computer scientist, when you know he or she wants to have this, it's Alan Turing, 
who wants to have this discussion with um, a clinician, you know, he or she might begin, well, you know, the, the, some, some words built on the previous talk by looking at activations of the hidden layers, we can do X. Or, you know, so we can talk about saliency maps that help us understand when information is most dispositive. And that's all English words. But the clinician <laughs> hears something different. Does anybody know what language, language this is? No? Oh, did I, someone thinks someone got it. It's a Swahili. It's Swahili. So um, he or she hears something that makes absolutely no sense. So in, the, in, a, in a sense, what constitutes really an explanation? To some, this is an explanation. But to the clinician, it's far from it. So explanations are inherently subjective. And they can differ from specialty to specialty. And I think this was alluded to in the previous. In the pre so me, uh, myself as a cardiologist, there'll be some dialogue that I may have with another cl clinician, in fact. And I may walk away and say, that made absolutely no sense. That was no explanation whatsoever. Because I come from a different frame of reference. Um, and it's challenging, consequently, to arrive at, a, at an objective definition of what constitutes an explanation. So I don't know how to write down what an explanation is in terms of a criterion that others should follow to be able to do this and apply this in a, in a, in a um, principled way to whatever model they could create. But I can sort of think about it a little bit if I think about necessary conditions for an explanation. So when is an explanation bad? So an explanation encompasses a discussion where all participants speak the same language. So I think first, the, the statements have to be that both people come from the same um, so come from the same background, but have the same um, have the same corpus of words in which they which they which they communicate, and I think in particular clinically, what makes this somewhat um, challenging is that the clinician will ask, um, "Does a model make reasonable inferences in light of my current understanding of human pathophysiology or medical science?" And so while we can't, while it's very hard to um, to to state objectively what a definition of explainability is in the healthcare sphere, I think it's more useful to talk about, well, I know that these criteria have to be met, because if it's not, then it won't be explainable at all. So just a quick, quick um, just example, I, I think along these lines, we developed a model once using the electrocardiogram for uh, risk prediction. I'm just going to go through that briefly, because I think it's just a, li a little insightful. So the electrocardiogram, I think most people, those who watch, I think it's, is it um, Grey's Anatomy? I don't know if that's still on TV. There's one of these shows where people go into the emergency room and they have surgery and all sorts of nonsense. And you'll, you'll see the electrocardiogram. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a continuous signal that represents electrical activity of the heart. We as cardiologists, we use this um, a lot. I think there's some electrophysiologists here, actually, are more familiar with this than myself. But we often look at parts of this to determine the risk of a patient when we first see them, when they have signs that are consistent with um, a heart attack or other sorts of myocardial injury. And there's a region of the electrocardiogram that we typically focus on. It's called the ST segment. When it's elevated or depressed and a patient has chest pain, we often are concerned that that patient is having a heart attack or an acute coronary syndrome. So we focus in laser uh, with a, you know, with a somewhat of a myopic view on the ST segment throughout the electrocardiogram for clinical decision making. So what we did, we said, well, can you do this automatically? Because you know, the, what we can look at by eye, the resolution is kind of is, is limited. The computer can look at things at an arbitrary level of resolution. So we segment the signal. Signal we looked, um, extracted the ST segments and made a neural network and combined that with other sort of patient features and did sort of a, you know, a deep learning model that would be able to predict. Um, risk of death sometime after presenting with acute coronary syndrome. Well, you know, I'm gonna, not going to go through all the laborious details, but the model does pretty well. If you look at the uh, neural network, the univariate hazard ratio, so your risk of dying 14 days if you are predicted to be high risk is significantly higher than if you're not, and 30 days, 60 days, and so forth. We show that this works, just all just to show you that the model works, so um, that it will work when you are mature, greater than 65, or when you're naive, less than 65. In many different patient subgroups, it still is applicable. But the question at the end of the day is, again, what has a model learned? So we began starting from a, a dictionary that the cardiologist understands. I think that was, that was the point there. That we, we start from a set of features in which you can at least begin to have a dialogue. So that language is the same. And we, the model incorporates lots of uh, patient features that the clinician recognizes as being important as, risk, as a, in playing a part in identifying high-risk patients. 
So, but is that, is that enough? Because the inner workings of the model is hard, is, is difficult to decipher. So the question is, getting back to the second point, is does a model make predictions that are consistent with what I know about disease? So what you can do is you can generate a large list of synthetic patients and, and synthetic models. There are a number of them that one can use. Um, simplest one just being a normal distribution as opposed to various types of GANs, I think, that have been started to use in the clinical sphere. Does so that come from some underlying distribution that one either that one assumes or learns? Feed that into the model. Look at the model outputs. The model output is a probability of death within some period of time. And then you could compute all different sorts of marginals. So what's your risk of death if you're over a particular age, if you have certain phenotype? And then you can say, the clinician can say, well, with this particular phenotype, what would be the risk of death? And you can ask reasoned questions about sort of the insights and inferences that the model makes. So what we did, we did this in different, uh, this is just one example. You can make these sorts of plots. You can look at age on one axis. You can look at the extent of ST segment changes, whether the ST segment is elevated or um, depressed. Remember, this is one of the things I said that we as clinicians look at, and we know from a variety of different data sources that those changes are associated with adverse outcomes. And then the model says that as you get older, you're at a higher risk of dying. It's a risk of death on this uh, z-axis here. And if you look at the ST segment elevation and depression, when the ST segment here becomes elevated or when it's depressed, that's the one in the 10, your risk of death is higher. So it makes sense. It makes sense. But so you can do this to sort of verify that the model has learned something that is, that is consistent with my prior knowledge. And you can learn new relationships because you can plot different things. I think there could be different hypotheses for, for uh, going forward. And we've applied this in different, different settings. So we also have a, another study where we look at a type of valvular disease called aortic stenosis. And we've been trying to predict um, the risk of death, aortic valve, or aortic valve replacement six months after the first diagnosis. And you can do the same sort of thing. We can sort of start up from a large list of features that may have an impact. We do a feature selection method, um, bootstrap lasso. I think many of you may be familiar with it to select a subset of features because it's easier to have this, this this colloquy with the, with, the, with the clinician when the number of features is reasonable. If you've got a million different features to start out with, it's hard to have an informed discussion with a healthcare professional. And then you can put this into a neural network and do the same sort of plots. And, and, so, and that's sort of been our approach, at least to meeting those two criteria that, we've, um, that I've outlined before. So in sum, explainability. Standard statistical measures of performance should not be the only metric of success when evaluating a machine learning model or any AI technology for clinical use. And uh, machine learning models are more likely to be embraced by clinicians when they are accompanied by additional metrics, identifying failure modes, and that you can verify that the, that the um, model is consistent with one's own prior understanding of disease. So uh, just to acknowledge um, just some, the people who, who did all of the work. So, Paul Byers, who I think is here and has a, has a poster, is a graduate student who did the trust work and the, um, and the explainability work. Wang Zidai is also here, who has a poster as well. He did some other work on oversampling I didn't talk about. And of course, our very talented collaborators from the IBM AI Watson Lab, Kenny Ong, Kristen Severson, and Yuri Khartoum. Okay, two minutes to spare. Thank you.